thank you for writing this book. Um, you know, I actually had a question. It's a really broad one, and it's of interesting strains of advertising. But I'm still really curious on, I mean, you have such, a, there's such a rich archive of the legal cases and the material culture that adds themselves, the, um, the books in your bibliography, you know, on writings, on advertising, and I still wonder what you think, why we haven't really had a book like this in British history archery, you know, if you've given that much thought, um, as opposed to, you know, the shelves of books in the United States and the assumption that the U.S. is a kind of consumer society, but of course that somehow Britain is a, a nation of shopkeepers, but no ads. So I just wondered if you could, you know, reflect on that a little bit, because it's really striking. There's just been nothing like this. It's really, um, starting fresh in a way. Yeah, thank you. I, th that's a good question to sort of end with. Maybe the British historians here will have thoughts. I, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, the Americans have done such, you know, they have such a rich shelf of books and on advertising in Britain. Maybe, maybe it's another iteration of the same disavowal of enchantment. I mean, that could be one explanation, but I, I mean, guys, chime in if you have any thoughts on this. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, right. yeah I, I, I do suddenly think I have an idea. It might be because of the thing that in the 20th century, consumer culture and especially advertising is seen as coming from America to Europe right. and mm -hmm. to Britain in particular. <coughs> and so America would be seen as the longest for looking at the history and a kind of oblivion of forgetting and, and not knowing willfully or not of our own history. I, I suspect that may be the reason because we're talking about histories in the 20th century of American advertising. And the, the, there's a corollary to that, which is that, and this, this is not, maybe not so true of literary studies, I don't know, but um, social history was uh, very allergic to capitalism in Britain. It wasn't interested in capitalism. It was more interested in labor yes. and forces of subversion. And capitalism, I mean, the, I mean, as everyone knows, the history of capitalism has been burgeoned since 2008, for obvious reasons, and it's affected even British historians. But I think American historians, as exactly as you say, Rachel, could not avoid the history of capitalism even before that, whereas British historians like to pretend it was already gone. <laughs> or never arrived. Or never arrived. <laughs> and, and, and look at some, I mean, Erica was talking about um, David Ogilvy and Confessions of an Advertising Man. Well, just six years before that, in the 1950s, we have Vance Papon's book, The Hidden yeah. Persuaders, which yeah. is a massive bestseller yeah. on both sides of the yeah. Atlantic. And that's uh, the fact of it being a best, this is an expose yeah. of the so called techniques of mass persuasion but, um, that are thought, are imagined to work um, on, every, on every human being in Eradicably, and there's a whole Cold War context with that. But the very fact that that book about manipulation, another big word at a time, the very, very fact that that book is such a, a bestseller, as if everyone loves to read about just how much we're being manipulated. Yeah. And that's, again, seen absolutely as a, um, the men of Madison Avenue. It's an American context, and, and, and so it's, the, it's, Ameri it's an American yeah. conspiracy it was, yeah. to it was do a, what the Russians are doing in another world. It was a trope, it was a trope in, in the yeah. 60s and 70s when really rather terrible British adverts were uh, being admired by British audiences to say, oh, at least we don't oversell things like the Americans, <laughs> you know? We just state the facts. We just sort of say, you know, buy Omo washing powder. But in America, they have to whip up this big fantasy about the housewife and, her, her, and the, the genie who appears in her sink and says he's going to clean it for her. And, but the British, again, they, they had this kind of rather complacent view that they were Im immune or un didn't need such well, I, I, I little bit disagree with you there, yeah. because 1957, which is when the Hidden Persuaders comes out, is two years after the beginning of TV advertising for the first time in the UK, we're on the commercial, the, the first commercial channel sure. of ITV. Sure. And then, so we have the BBC, which is the fact and the sober yeah. presentation of information, and then the contrast with the commercial channel. Yeah. And so that's, again, see, the fear of, are we getting are we getting Yeah, to and America? you have the building your Part, yeah. which was all about that, which yeah. is, are we going to be Americanized? Yeah. But again, yeah. as you say, the threat is coming from America. Yeah. Yeah. I do think that there was a, a belief in great, basic British common sense, which made Brits more immune to those kinds of uh, blandishments than Americans. 
Netherlands. Or that's, <laughs> or that's an important boundary work that they have kept on doing yes, when exactly. we are not America. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay, guys, this is kind of getting late. I just want to say thanks and, and, and leave you with something uh, fun. Um, and, and so really, really deep, my deepest thanks first to all of you for being here, uh, to, to Galia um, and to uh, Ruth Safran, my partner in crime in many things, including our Love and Prejudice workshop and to our students here, uh, to my dean, to Corinne Levy and Tali Guy from his office. Uh, and to the Berg Institute and the Kinnear uh, workshop, and of course to my uh, lovely friends and family and partner without whom none of this uh, would have been possible. Uh, what, I'd, what I'd like to, to leave you with is just recently I found that uh, the renowned Israeli poet Agi Mishol wrote a poem that is just right for now, and so what Aggie agreed to do, she couldn't be with us today, but she, uh, but she uh, sort of read, it's a short poem. Uh, I translated it and it's now a formal translation. She approved the translation. It is called Disenchantment, believe it or not. Um, and so she read it in Hebrew, will then read the translation and uh, hopefully it will end there. <laughs> מתפזרים אז להורים, הכרכרה הופכת לבלעת, הסוסים לעברים, והסחבות מתחילות לבצבץ, כמו גם אוזני החמור מול עיניה הנדהמות של פיטניה. כשהמילה פג מנקבת את המילה קסם, צירופי מקרים, שוב רק צירופי מקרים, והמילים אזרחיות מתרוקנות כמו סוללות. כשפעל נוגעת בקסם, הזמן מתגלה לרגע ומגחך. כשהמילה פג... When this touches the word enchantment, the glitters scatter. The coach turns into pumpkin, the horses into mice, and the rags begin to show, as do the donkeys used before Titania's astonished eyes. When this pierces the word enchantment, coincidences are again only coincidences and the words prosaic, emptied out like batteries. When this touches enchantment, time reveals itself for a moment and sneers. So I think we should keep on studying enchantment in law and the economy and in culture and hopefully we'll see some glitters. <laughs> so have a lovely weekend. Thank you for coming.